Hi everyone and welcome to another Office Hours. I am Zoe from the Rebus community and I think it's still May. I think that's where we are uh, with our May Office Hours, um, which is yet again filled with a, a great lineup of experts here to chat to us about budgets and budgeting, um, which should be a lot more fun than some people might think. Um, I think we're gonna have fun with it. And so to start, I will hand over to Karen, uh, my lovely co-host from the Open Textbook Network to introduce those guests. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Zoe, for that lovely introduction. As she said, I'm Karen with the Open Textbook Network. I'm delighted to introduce our three guests today who will talk about budgets and budgeting tools. We are joined by Matthew Bloom, who is English faculty at Scottsdale Community College and Open Educational Resources Coordinator at Maricopa Community Colleges. Tonya Farrell, who is Open Educational Resources Coordinator at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And Richard Saunders, Collections Librarian and former Dean of Library Services at Southern Utah University. So if there's anyone out there who is joining Office Hours for the first time, our format is to hear briefly from our guests for about five minutes, talking about their experience with budgets and budgeting tools, as that's the topic this month. And then after 15 or so minutes, we will turn things over to all of you to ask questions and get the conversation started. We will be sharing the tools and resources that are discussed today, so you can look for those in the chat. And feel free to start um, chatting in the chat and posting your questions as you hear from our guests. So to kick us off, I'm going to turn things over to Matthew Bloom. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will say that um, a little bit of the discussion here has to do with um, budgeting spreadsheets and things like that. And I just want to preface everything by saying that I actually only put a spreadsheet together uh, for this fiscal year which is ending for us you know, at the end of June. I, I just put the budgeting spreadsheet together about a month ago because this is the first time, and maybe that this is gonna sound insincere or in you know, something along those lines, but this is really the first year that we've ever actually spent uh, anywhere close to the money that our institution has given us for OER. And I know that's very different than probably most institutions um, you know, the Maricopa Community Colleges are, um, it's a really large system. It's 10 separate colleges that are all connected in the Phoenix area. Uh, Phoenix area, we have uh, about 200,000 students annually, 1,400 faculty and it's uh, full-time faculty and countless adjuncts. And so we have a lot of resources and they've given us those resources in the past. Um, and it was only this year that I was really able to finally figure out a way to spend all the money that they've given us to spend. Um, which sounds, yeah, I know that sounds unreasonable, sounds crazy, but um, so I think that I, I guess my, to end my preface and just directly go into some of the points that experiences that I'd like to share would say that um, the, the budgeting aspect for me is really a matter of um, thinking about how you can first use the existing resources that your institution has already committed to in other ways. When it comes to tools for publishing OER or sharing OER, um, it wasn't until very recently. In fact, we are at like right now, um, we think next week, finally going to be turning on our instance of Pressbooks EDU. We're really excited about finally getting that uh, for our faculty. Um, but the cost associated with, with that is pretty much the only thing that we have ever committed to out of our budget to support our faculty other than uh, the, the large majority of the funding that we um, allocate for uh, OER production goes to faculty stipends and, and reassign time. And so I hadn't really needed any kind of a spreadsheet. And besides, I'm an English literature person. I am not a budgeting person or a spreadsheet person. That's definitely something I've learned over the last two and a half years as the OER coordinator at, 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 for our district. But um, I think the, the first thing is, again, you know, we had been so, so I guess what I would say is, is, and this is probably very obvious, but when you're thinking about the money that you have, um, you want to always start with what's the end goal, right? And the end goal, like what, what, what do you want to do? Um, you, you know, what, what kind of like, um, you know, final, you know, impact do you want to make? And for us, of course, it's students, uh, student success, access to the information, and saving money, of course. And we could do most of that for our students using our learning management system as a publishing mechanism. So we use Canvas and for the 
like six years, the first six years of Maricopa Millions project, um, we were not spending any money supporting publishing or anything like that for our faculty other than on, again, giving them reassigned time or some stipends to you know, do the work itself. Um, so it was actually pretty simple for us because we had the money and then we did that. And, and then actually, this is something I, I found, again, this is like a, a burden of, of abundance in a way, but you know, we found year after year that we would actually be surprised at how much money we had left over. And the reason why is because we would allocate funding towards reassigned time or some other stipends for faculty to do projects, but then inevitably um, some of those projects didn't finish. And so the faculty stipends weren't paid out. And so then at the end of the year, we would have this chunk of money that we didn't know what to do with. And I can't speak for obviously any other institution, but I know at ours, um, it's not actually very easy to spend money. There's a lot of steps that you have to go through in order to do any kind of purchasing or anything like that. Um, and so, uh, which is a good thing because we want to be responsible stewards of, of public money. But the point is, is that we are, um, you know, in, in those, those previous years, we had, you know, approached the end of the fiscal year, just looking at the kind of um, the, the bare bones budget allocation that we had been approved for. So I never really had a spreadsheet type of thing. It was more just like a bullet pointed list of estimated amounts and the kind of things we wanted to do, which would be like, um, you know, thinking about, again, the faculty stipends, but also travel um, publication, uh, I'm sorry, production of promotional materials. So if we were going to print out a bunch of flyers or make stickers or something along those lines, then we wanted to make sure to have a line for that uh, in an amount. Uh, we're a member of the Community College Consortium for OER, so we had to include that as well, uh, the, the membership fee for that, which isn't, which isn't much. And so a lot of those things kind of um, just took care of themselves. And again, you know, because of the fact that um, we tried to be more ambitious this year, um, it became necessary finally for me to put together a spreadsheet. Now, and I, I would be happy to share kind of the template of that spreadsheet with, with everybody after this. Um, I just want to go through and take out all the names because we have all the faculty names and stuff like that in there. Um, but I would just say that it is a vast majority just payouts to faculty because that's the model that we've adopted. So we didn't really need so much to, um, and, and this is again, I mean, I, I actually work a lot with the fiscal office, at the, I'm sorry, the fiscal agent at our provost's office uh, who does a lot of that kind of back end stuff. So I would say, you know, utilize the existing resources that the college already has or the institution already has to try to, um, you know, support what, what you want to do so that you don't even have any kind of a budget impact at all on that. Um, and then if you are, uh, you know, paying out stipends or committing uh, funds to faculty for projects, we have found that it is a good idea to, um, to wait and pay it out at the end of a project upon the, the deliverable, um, because what has happened a number of times is, like I said, you know, it will be paid out slowly over an entire semester or even an academic year. And then if the project for some reason or another does not actually you know, finish, then we're left with like a half-baked project that we've paid some money for. Um, and maybe not the full amount that had been granted in the first place, but nonetheless, that's the, um, that's the case there. So I think that's pretty much what I would say, just, um, just to share a couple of my experiences there. And I hope that that's a little bit helpful or that it's at least on topic. Um, I, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has, so. Thanks, Matthew, and thanks in advance for sharing the template. I'm sure others will be interested in using it. I will now turn things over to Tonya. Hi, I'm Tonya Farrell at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, we started our OER program in 2018, and I do have a chatty baby in the background, so you will likely hear her throughout this. Um, I was hired as part of that initiative as we started it. We received $50,000 from Central Administration, which oversees all four Nebraska campuses, um, to start our OER program. 
And so with that, we also decided to put a majority of our funds to uh, faculty stipends. We, I did a lot of research at the beginning to see what other people were paying out and things like that. And we decided on $2,500 for a faculty stipend to convert your course from a traditional textbook to either low cost, no cost, or things like library materials. So kind of affordable content wholly, not just OER. Um, and we landed on that based on partly what other people were doing, partly that um, like online course development grants at our institution were in the $3,000 range. So it was sort of in line with that. Um, and we did that no matter how they decided to convert. So if they were just adopting, that's the same as if they were creating their own materials just for consistency for us to make it easier on our end and also because an adoption can be just as much work as an adaptation depending on you know what you're doing and if you're redesigning your entire course that's a lot of work and so we wanted to kind of honor that too so i have a few spreadsheets i think karen has one um, i'd be happy to share any of them uh, we do our payments in three sections so as part of our grant they are required to come to an oer workshop that i put on um, they get 500 dollars after attending that then after they've done the work of converting and have like the course ready to go, they get an additional thousand. And then at the end of their first semester of teaching it, after they turn in their faculty report to us, they get the remaining thousand um, dollars. So that is kind of how we have it set up here. I track those in my spreadsheet. It's not a fancy spreadsheet. It doesn't utilize all of the technology I know that uh, Excel can handle, um, but it works for us. And then we also have started kind of delving into more like large scale grants, we're calling them. And so if it's a course that is going to be, you know, like ours is marketing 3200 is the first one we did. And there's, I think, eight instructors and they all teach the same book. And so we're calling it a large scale grant. It's a larger grant. And um, they, we put a spreadsheet together for the people who get the grant to sort of propose a budget to us. So I think our, we said we would give up to 20,000 and then they have to propose like how much each instructor should get, which deliverables they're going to uh, create as part of that and sort of how it's broken up person by person. And then the third spreadsheet that I have is just the OER budget overall for our program. So we talk about like how many grants we're going to give per semester, um, other things we're going to spend money on. We have grants, we have one grant from central administration, we have some library funds involved, and then we have a library grant involved. Um, so it sort of breaks up where all of those are coming from and kind of what the total costs are. So that's, and then we are looking to get into publishing. And so, we will likely be starting that in the coming year, and we have budgeted $10,000 for those. We're not quite sure how we're going to break that out. We're thinking maybe 5,000 for the authors and then 5,000 to go towards editing and structuring and those types of things. Um, but as we're just kind of starting out in that, we haven't officially decided or publicized anything. Thanks, Tanya. I will hand things over to Richard now. Richard, you're muted. I, I unmute myself. There it is. Um, and I guess that's a nice segue because my contribution um, to this conversation is I spent a number of years formally working in academic publishing, um, working for the enemy, as I sometimes say. This actually was my last book that I did. Big academic stats book. Um, there's a whole story that goes along with that, but I'll let, I'll let that one go. Um, my contribution to open publishing right now is a spreadsheet that uh, Karen has had, of it, Karen will have available, that is intended to do exactly what Tanya had, is planning to do, and what Colleen had asked about, um, about having a press on board. I was a pro project manager, which means I handled the budgets and the staffing and everything else. Uh, I was one of six, but I had a staff of 120 people. Um, so that might skew my experiences just a little bit. 
Now, keep in mind that was a commercial publisher, so that was it was a whole a whole different world. What I learned in that process is something that everybody should remember, and that is that open publishing may end costs to the end user, but it does not end cost to production. Um, and that's what this, this spreadsheet of mine is aimed at, is to try and help people who are going into formal publication where you actually have either a digital file or a print file, make some decisions about what can we afford and how are we gonna do it. Um, the cost, I mean, it's not flawless and it probably got things in there that you won't use, but it breaks down the costs involved in formal book, book production into a group of classes that you should be able to both estimate and track. Uh, I will remind everyone, um, while it's an, an obvious question or an obvious statement, and that is that time is money. Anytime you put something into it, you're putting cash into it. So um, while I've encouraged um, open publishing as just kind of absorbing the costs, that comes at a cost of not doing something else, either in the library or in a position or in something else. So that's, that's my background. I, I encourage people to think in terms of time and money because whether or not it's important to you or your program, it's going to be important to somebody you report to and they're gonna to wanna to have hard numbers if they want, if you're gonna go a particular direction. So that's what the spreadsheet's aimed at and that's, uh, that's the way that I've looked at it. It has room in it, by the way, for including things like grants to authors and contract and all kinds of other things like that. And I'll leave it at that and throw it open for questions now, Karen. Okay, thanks, Richard. I put links in the chat, everyone, to one of Tonya's spreadsheets and uh, Richard's spreadsheet. Please note the many tabs and features of Richard's spreadsheet, as he said, you know, with his professional history, He's really accustomed and experienced into digging into some details. And so um, if, if this is too much budgeting for your program, it's still a wonderful overview of all of the many things that um, can be included in the production of a textbook. So uh, as Richard invited you, I do the same. Um, please post your questions in the chat or feel free to unmute for Tanya, Matthew, or Richard about their budgeting process. Colleen did post a question in the chat as you guys were talking, and she asks, does having a publisher or press on campus reduce costs when creating and publishing OER? Can I answer that? Because I've actually had to deal with that recently, and the answer is an unequivocal no. Especially because if you've got a, somebody on staff or on there, they have their own budgets that must be met. So one way or another, the money has got to come in to cover the production costs for whatever goes out the door. I also sat in on a library publishing forum session a few weeks ago um, where presses were talking about collaborating with libraries on the production of OER. And I think this was, you know, also sort of something that they are figuring out and working together. You know, it doesn't fit with the university press model to produce OER. And so everybody's just kind of taking a look at things. Um, if anyone else was in that session and remembers any takeaways, please feel free to chime in. Um, Matthew, were your faculty stipends in the same range as Tanya's? If I remember right, uh, Tanya said $2,500 for a course conversion. And then was it around 10,000 perhaps for authoring? We, ha we've, we have awarded one technically for authoring, but she hasn't moved forward at all on uh, that project. And we're sort of stalled as well. So that is our budgeted amount. And we'll see if that ends up being sufficient. Can I toss one other thing? The other thing that you neglected to mention, Karen, is that Richard is also opinionated, but thank you. <laughs> Um, as, as somebody who has done some writing on the side, I will re remind people that writing a book is a long, long involved process. Um, you know, I've got one text, one volume of mine that I'm just finishing after 27 years of work. Um, that's very common for some kinds of writing. You don't get it all done, just sit down and type it out. It, it really takes some time. So the grants you may look at, you might want to think very seriously about 
um, benchmarks, but also much longer than just a simple academic year. Even with a course release, a faculty member, it's very, very unlikely that a faculty member can generate a genuine textbook in a year. I, that, that's very optimistic. So, I have, I, oh, sorry. sorry, I had a question. Go ahead, Matthew, when you finish, and then I'll ask. Well, I just wanted to respond uh, by saying that our thinking about publishing OER and supporting faculty uh, publication of OER is very, very different. We're not even, we, we, we very rarely expect any faculty members to, with the money we give them, write a book. Uh, in fact, we have completely rethought, I, I mean, we, we have a completely different way of thinking about uh, providing educational materials, learning materials for, to our students, you know? Um, the concept of the, 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 the unified, you know, textbook is the monolithic, like, container of all the information that we're gonna provide to our students. While that may work in some situations, we have, we have not pursued that at all. Um, the amount of money that we provide to our faculty for an individual, now we don't pay faculty to convert their courses to OER, we pay faculty to um, adopt or adapt materials that they can then share with others and that we kind of use those as a template uh, for other faculty uh, who may want to you know, also adapt resources as well. So no, nobody's really writing an entire course on their own for the um, $3,600 that we give them as an individual. Um, so that's what it is for, uh, for our traditional grants. They get four um, load hours of reassigned time or they can take that as an overload. So the equivalent is approximately $3,600. Um, I totally agree with Richard. I mean, I'm a writer too. And the fact is, is that like, you know, some writing projects take years and years and years and years. And that is a very, um, that's a very true thing. Um, but a lot of the faculty projects that we fund are, um, it's almost like the funding that we're providing is just the, in, the additional incentive they need to take the, the extra steps to um, ensure that the materials that they're already creating and adapting for their classes are drawn from legitimately open materials and not stolen, you know, kind of not, not abusing copyright, um, and also trying to incentivize them to create some materials on their own. And we, we're thinking about learning objects more than, um, you know, complete courses, because we, we also kind of have, have, have gone back to that idea that, you know, while there is a benefit to having a single full course ready to go, or a single full textbook ready to go, um, there is also the sense, I think right now, especially, that a lot of faculty like to pick and choose. They like to, they like to take uh, from the buffet of resources that are out there, especially if we've already had them kind of converted to open in some sense. They like remixing, they like adapting. Um, and so if they, if they do it without us giving them any money, they're probably still gonna be doing it anyway. But what we've been doing is, is incentivizing them to go that extra step to make sure that what they do is legitimate so that they're taking the time to do all the appropriate attributions, you know, and, and, and everything that needs to be done uh, so that it's a legitimate open resource in the end that we can then share with, with other faculty. So if it's okay to jump in here, <laughs> I had uh, two questions and thank you, Matthew, for that. So first for Matthew and possibly Tanya and, and the way you guys are distributing the money for for uh, your faculty members to incentivize them. Um, I was just wondering if um, you're doing anything to track your return on that investment because you know as much as it's great to get them moving to actually be able to you know as Richard pointed out go back to the powers that be and say look you we gave out this much money but this translated to x amount of um, you know time that your other faculty, this many faculty are saving and having to create these materials because this is how often it's been reused, or this is time that this the faculty itself didn't have to work on something else because now it's integrated and, and it's allowed them to work on this other research or program or whatever. So I was just wondering if you guys are tracking any of that and how you do it. And the other question was for Richard, um, uh, which I hope it's okay to, I. I'm hoping I can contact you later because I have a lot of questions for you, Richard. You're like right along the lines of the kinds of things I was hoping for for the session. Um, if would your experience with that commercial publisher, if you can share with us what has 
been the thing that you notice is most different in terms of the allocation of, of funding required for creating a textbook versus, you know, the kind of materials that you might have been creating. If there are certain expenses that, that we should expect uh, for OER that are not in a traditional monograph or, or a trade book, or if maybe there's something that we don't have to worry about, because I've been looking at uh, uh, also at, at budgeting and, and business models to, to try to adopt here at University of Virginia. And um, I'm finding that, you know, there's a lot of information out there, but it's mostly for mono, monographs. Like we don't, your OER, we don't tend to look at it this way, like the more businessy type of, you know, accounting. Um, and so I'm just trying to find, you know, I'm, I've kind of found some things that are different, but I was just wanted your professional opinion. So two questions. Whoever wants to start. <laughs> So I can talk about the way we're tracking it. Um, so we we don't, so we're sort of starting out with the faculty who are doing the conversions. They're sort of the only ones using the materials at this point. We're asking them to promote it in their departments and if other people teach their courses, but because of our um, unions and faculty choice and things like that, we don't want to do any forcing of them to share. Um, and it, that's a very hot topic with our faculty. They're very concerned about protecting that right, rightfully so. Um, so we've just sort of started thinking about that. And hopefully as we move into further time, we'll do more promotion of like, oh, hey, did you know this professor who teaches the same course as you uses these open materials and here's their syllabus and you could use this as well. Um, but we do track like how much their prior textbook cost, how much they are charging now, because we do allow $40 or under to be considered low cost. So if they maybe use uh, some sort of so like a clicker software, um, maybe it costs $15 still for the students. And we take the cost that the students are saving and we divide it by two to try to, um, you know, integrate rentals and used books and things like that. And with that, we've converted 20 courses and saved students $180,000 so far. Um, so with my salary and the grant, we're about at the break even point now. And hopefully we'll start to see that return on investment grow as the courses are offered more and more because we've only offered courses for I think two semesters for the most part. Um, we're at sort of an interesting time period because the original grant is gone. Um, and we haven't seen administration jump yet at renewing it in the same way. So um, we have some academic affairs folks who are interested in um, converting specific courses like gen eds and things like that, which is great. Um, but we don't have that sort of like open, like anybody who wants to apply and convert a course as it has been in the last two years, we don't have that structure right now. So hopefully, seeing these savings, they'll start to be um, convinced that we should keep that program going, but we're at sort of a crossroads at UNO right now. Let me just real quick uh, mention, uh, respond to Hany, Hany's, Hany? Okay, Hany's question. Um, I think probably the best, the best thing to do, if you want to really get a look at the way OER might go, uh, forward is to open the front of any commercial textbook and notice the number of people who are involved as fact checkers, graphic designers, all those kinds of question banks, all those kind of things. That's the potential cost involved. Actually, when I counted for this book, um, there were approximately 125 other individu individuals other than the author involved in the production of the text. So when you're, th when you're thinking about a, a major publishing, um, <clears throat> if you're headed into textbooks, that's something you're going to want to factor. Just for comparison, in 1990, 1996, when I did this last four-color book, my production budget was a quarter of a million dollars. When you look at the, what was paid to the authors and the editorial and, and the manufacturing and the distribution, that's why textbooks are ridiculously expensive because it costs a lot of money to generate them at that scale. Now, there's ways around having to pay out that much money, but it certainly gets, a, it gets um, administrators' attention when you can put things into six figures 
either as cost or cost absorbed or in savings. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. When you look at what Hewlett Foundation paid to get uh, OpenStax up and running and what's involved there, you know, that's, that's something similar. Um, part of the value of open is in people agreeing not to be paid in order to go forward to make this thing work. So, you know, I'm, I will admit um, I'm a bit biased toward the monographic, partly because that's easily distributable and easily assumable. Um, and then it can be used uh, past that. But th does, does that kind of give you a, a context for, for what cost is involved? Okay. Oh, if I can chime in there a little bit, I think what's really useful about that understanding is, is understanding what a kind of fully fledged, if we call it, publishing process looks like in the way that it's been done. And I think Jonathan um, raised a really important point in the chat is we, we have the opportunity to do more than just replicate that with an open license. It's also very, very useful. So I think someone like OpenStax, they largely work in a similar fashion um, to, to do that kind of work. They have very, very extensive teams working on each of their texts. And the output is brilliant. It's really useful. It's foundational content that can then be kind of taken and used in lots of different ways. And that's incredibly valuable for us to have. And there should be more and more of it, absolutely. I think with open education, we can also challenge a little bit of that being the only way to do things and the value being of being part of a process of publishing just being about financial reward. That said, got to balance it with rewarding labor. This is very kind of complex and you can follow down lots of lots of threads on this. Um, but I think that having clarity on what can go into something allows people who are in the position of building a budget and then executing it to identify what is possible and then think about what their needs are and really find, I think, something of a middle ground between just asking people to do the work because they're, you know, intrinsically motivated to do it which I don't think many of us do. I know so many institutions put so much work into making sure that there are stipends available to, to recognize the work being done and needing to have a you know quarter of a million dollar budget. There's a lot of range within that. And uh, you know what I really liked kind of hearing from the three guests here today is, is there is there is a range there and that you can, I don't think there's one solution. I think there's enough variation in you know, the, the position that people are in, what's possible at their institutions, all of those kinds of things that mean we do need to be creating our own systems, but we can do that informed by the sharing of information like this within the community. And that's what's really, really helpful here. Um, as Tonya and Matthew were, think, were talking in particular, I keep thinking of the phrase, just enough tool. Um, and then it can be really overwhelming to start from, oh, I need to have, you know, a budget spreadsheet that has 50 tabs and I have to fill in every single cell. But if you have that as a reference, you can then take from it what's useful and make just enough tool for what it is that you're trying to achieve in your context. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that's my attempt to kind of contribute to that and, and recognize I think there's huge value in what you're saying, Richard, about actually understanding the cost of this work and then also thinking about how we can do it differently within our contexts, with, the, with what is available, and still be advocating for what we know is really important, which is to pay people adequately for their work wherever possible. Right, and, and I think you, you hit a key, and that is that one size, well, there should not be a one size fits all. There just flat out should not be. Um, so let, let's go back. I, I neglected to answer one thing that, that Hani had asked, and that is what kind of things in a traditional textbook would you maybe not see, or vice versa, what, what may be an open that's not in a traditional textbook. I think one of the key, key matters is links. Um, going back and checking links once the thing is established is a headache. Um, as somebody who has taught, um, taught classroom stuff using open materials and all kinds of things, I had to go back every single term and check my links for videos, for audio, for, for even for open material that ended up being moved on somebody's server someplace. So link, links are the, are the biggest headache and the biggest cost, especially as you go forward downstream. Once it's been created and adopted, that's where your maintenance cost is. 
Yeah, and I, I agree with that, but I also think that if we are actually exercising the 5R permissions of the licensing, then we have, um, especially if your institution has, and again, nothing's free, right? There's always going to be an institutional cost associated with whatever you're doing. So if you are going to actually host all the materials yourself, somebody at your institution is going to have to take over that, um, you know, the, the maintenance there. And so, but the question is, do we want to, I mean, this is the, uh, the big question, obviously, that we're all here trying to address. To what extent does that cost need to be absorbed by the institution? And to what extent does that cost need to be passed on to the students, right? Because people do need to be paid for their labor and there is labor involved. But I would also say though, that the linking issue, um, you know, uh, to go back to that, to clarify what I mean by that, I think we really are exercising the five R permissions, one of which is the ability to retain the material, right? So I always try to emphasize to my faculty, we learned the hard way that in the, the first couple of years that we provided grants to our faculty to adapt materials or to even generate some of their own materials and share them, we had many faculty members who created courses that were pretty link heavy. They were, they were relying on either freely accessible online materials, um, which are not OER, or they were um, just out of habit, I guess. I don't wanna say laziness because that's not a nice thing to do and I don't know what their motivation was, but, but the fact is they didn't go through the additional steps necessary when they were permitted to do so by the license to actually copy everything over and make sure that it was formatted appropriately in the material that they were actually creating themselves. So that there would be no linking, right? The only link would be uh, just providing the URLs so that you know, you're attributing the source appropriately. But um, so if we are actually making sure that we have professional development in place so that our faculty authors know that that extra step is kind of vital, then, and, and also a way to further incentivize them is, is the, the I don't want to say promise, but it's kind of like a promise of less work in the future. If you take the extra time now, copy everything over the right way, retain so that you can actually retain those materials, then that's great. It's another thing like with YouTube, for example. A lot of our faculty, I have at the beginning when I started as the OER coordinator, I had faculty saying, well, look, we found all these great videos on YouTube that are openly licensed, we're linking to blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, well, they're openly licensed. What you should do is you should download those videos and upload them onto your own YouTube channel so that you have them all together because the license permits you to do that. If you are just relying on the YouTube link, then yeah, it's just a matter of that content, you know, whoever, whoever's controlling that content, all they have to do is make the decision to put a paywall up or to take the content down or to forget about it. And, and then you're relying on them. And that goes against, to me, goes against the whole concept of open education. We want to not only be openly sharing things, but also being able to kind of control our own copies of those things. Um, and, and I feel like that's um, one of the, um, one of the aspects of the five R's that we can really try to avail ourselves of. I, I agree with you, but I gotta, I gotta say I have a different experience um, having been a dean who filled up a server and then had to go back to the administration to justify another server, that was a hard sell. So remember, whether or not you download and, and exercise the five R's, there will be a cost involved because somebody's got to hold the server space. And once you've created that, there's gonna, it's going to have to get weeded periodically. Um, you're going to have to go back and either decide that you're going to use it or maintain, plus, you know, you've got to maintain the server and all of that. That's that hidden cost of OER that should be factored. That's one reason why there's a maintenance tab in my, in the spreadsheet, because just because you have it once doesn't mean you have it forever. You know, servers go down, they get moved. Um, when I was in a former position, someone lost a server. It was not, not a partial server. It was in the stack someplace, but nobody knew which of the hard machines it was actually on. So that's, that's, that's my, my warning or my caveat that, that while we may be perfectly well within reason and a very good idea, there's always a cost involved. And understanding that cost and not burying it is really important because there's no, there's no surer way to end administrative support for an OER program than to say, well, here's what we're saving, but here's all the hidden costs that we haven't told you about. That's, that's my real fear. Okay, yeah. well, uh, if, I, if I may, I know we have a few more questions building up here and I really appreciate the conversation and of course how 
um, we allocate our resources and what that says about our values and our, our programs and to acknowledge, you know, what Zoe said and um, Matt and Richard about, you know, well, what are we publishing? There are many different ways to publish and certainly I think all of us would agree there are many ways to do this thing and just it's important to take many considerations into account and then adjust for all of our individual context where we are. So Zoe did uh, mention Jonathan's comment in the chat and I'm just gonna bring it up now because I think it's most fitting with what we've been discussing. And that is his question about whether or not we're duplicating in the open ed world much of what is wrong with current academic publishing, which is of course a great question to explore. I just want to note that um, in the Open Textbook Network, as many of you know, it's not so much that we revere the textbook or think that it is the best learning object ever. It's simply that it is such a common starting point for faculty in introducing OER and not necessarily trying to, to change all the things all at once. Um, and so there's absolutely many creative and exciting ways that um, we can explore pedagogy through open. Um, and so I think, I think that's also something we're probably all on the same page about. So I appreciate the, the question and conversation. I'd like to turn to Deb's question in the chat. Uh, her acknowledgement uh, to Richard's comment and Karen Bjork in the chat who said, textbooks can take a long time. I think Richard said 27 years. Uh, Karen went with a shorter four. Um, and Deb is asking if anyone creates milestones or something else to help authors stay on track and keep distractions of other projects from being more distracting. So Deb is asking, I think, for project management tools and just to highlight that Karen Bjork did share a tool that they use there at Portland State in the chat. And I invite um, any of our guests or other people in this call to chime in with their tools. Matt, you mentioned it might be best to wait for a deliverable. And it sounded like you were saying the whole kit and caboodle rather than kind of um, staggering payment with different phases of the project. Do you care to expand? Yeah, I, well, so, you know, we, we've done it both ways and we've had pretty good success. And, and just to clarify, I, mean, I think I've made it pretty clear that we have not been um, really asking faculty to, to, to write entire textbooks or create entire courses. So it's more in, um, paying them to do adaptation and to try to promote not only just use the materials themselves, try to promote it amongst their colleagues in their departments or different colleges and things like that. So it's really, it's kind of like trying to get them to change their behaviors more than, than create a, like new materials. Um, although that is part of what is involved. Um, but I do think that the, there's a, there's, there's two different ways that we've done it. We've done it in, in, in the way where we would just schedule the pay so that, I mean, basically if it's reassigned time for faculty, then it takes, you know, it, they don't have to pay, they don't have to teach as many classes, right? So it, what it is, is it's, it's carving out, you know, dedi supposedly dedicated time during an academic term for them to focus on that project rather than another project. Now, a lot of our faculty actually choose to take those hours as overload. So it's just extra money. So it is, you know, them, uh, and we don't forbid that, that's fine. Uh, when we have paid it out like that, then it just, it's obviously it's spread out over an entire academic term. They don't receive a stipend at the end. It's just happening. Um, the negative thing with that is that if for some reason someone drops out, um, you know, we, we actually, even when we do our Maricopa Millions grants, our traditional course development, you know, adaptation grants, um, they're three, uh, three to four semesters long, right? So we actually, we, we have like a semester we kind of give them an option to schedule it, but there are three, three or four chunks to it, right? Because they have a total of four load hours that they get for it, and they can spread that out, up, you know, up to two years. Um, and so the idea is, is that, you know, they would get paid the first semester for training, the second semester for materials development, and then third semester for piloting the materials in live in the classroom, and then making those final, you know, final changes before they publish it. Um, via Canvas Commons or through My Open Math or, or whatever uh, you know, platform they're using. So that works and that worked for a long time, but then we did have some faculty teams who kind of dissolved halfway through. So then that means that we've in, invested uh, you know, a few load hours, a few thousand dollars in a project that actually in the end didn't even go anywhere. 
Now we have a, I sent that, I put that link in the chat earlier because we have a different type of grant, which is more, um, it's not kind of a, a full course development, you know, materials adaptation thing. It's more like, uh, it, it, we call them 2.0 open grants um, because the, we wanted our faculty to be able to focus on smaller chunks. So rather than paying them um, an exorbitant amount of money for this enormous work that they're gonna do over the course of years, we're asking them to say, well, what are, the, like, look at the materials that you're using right now or the materials that are available in your discipline right now. What is the gap that you think needs to be filled? And then what specifically, like, how many clock hours do you want us to pay you for that? And then they get our, sta our standard rate for those contracts are $28 an hour. So then they will tell us how many hours they think it's gonna take. And then for those grants, we pay them on deliverable. So because it's usually they're, they're, they're smaller chunks. Some of them are as little as like $700 that we've given out um, because faculty are literally only going back through a couple of videos they created a few years ago and adding captions that they didn't add then when they were, you know what I mean? Like doing, doing like some of those like additional pieces of work that need to be done. Um, it is a headache for me because then instead of me just having like one big grant to worry about, I have a whole lot of little ones to worry about. Um, but in the end, you know, I, I, I like to think that so that, that it's been pretty good so far, but we've only been doing that for about 18 months now. And uh, we haven't actually, we, some of those projects have been completed and published in Canvas Commons, but we haven't really gone through and collected them and turned them into, you know, started to promote them yet. So I don't want to claim that it like has solved our problems, but those are the two different ways we approach it. Thanks, Matt. I could jump in on that just for a second too. I've also found it helps faculty because we don't require them to know exactly what they're using beforehand because we want them to come to the workshop and see how to search for things well and things like that. And so by giving them a little bit at the beginning and then more after they've done the work, we say, you know, if you get into this and you can't find things that you think are appropriate for your class, you can pull out. That's fine. You know, you've done the workshop we'll pay you for that part and if this is not something that fits with your course that's okay we don't think that's going to happen but that's okay and that has helped people feel better about applying to the grant and this week was the first week i got somebody pull out and that's only because he accepted a teaching position somewhere else so um, it's worked well for us in that regard too thanks i'll add also um to Deb's question, I know that our partners at Scribe do weekly check-ins in terms of reminding the project teams where they are, what needs to happen, how to get it done. Um, and so, you know, there's just a big piece of project management involved to try and keep people on track. And so I'm sure there's trade-offs between, as Matt said, having kind of a, a big project where you might be working with one person, but there's just it, it feels more uh, monolithic or just a little too meaty and then working with more people on smaller projects might mean that you do less like hey how are you doing on this massive project but more you know housekeeping and administration on, on a different on a different side. Mm -hmm. Somewhat similarly the way we've structured the TSP program is that we have weekly check-ins for the first 12 weeks because that's often when people are getting up to speed and then we transition into a monthly check-in and that's as a, as a group of about 10 projects checking in together so that kind of pacing over then a full 12 month period um, has, has kind of been what we've seen as, as useful for, for projects too. Matt Ruin had a question in the chat. Tanya, have you or anyone else dealt with pushback about paying grants to redesign or revise a course using OER? I've run into concerns that improving and revising courses is part of normal job expectations for faculty, so extra payment for it, for it is inappropriate. I think there's been an ongoing um, chat conversation about this. Um, Tanya, do you care to chime in? I see you answered in chat as well, but yeah, so, um, so I work partly with 50% out of the library, 50% out of digital learning, and our digital learning office does have a culture of paying for campus refreshes already. Um, so you can apply, it's, I don't know what the amount is, it's not as much to do a refresh, and that would be going through your course with an instructional designer and making sure everything looks the way that they suggest it looks. Um, and so we already sort of had that culture on campus. So I haven't seen that pushback. And we've also really marketed it as sort of, um, we know faculty are overworked and underpaid and we really just wanna honor their time in this and give them the dedicated time, you know, dedicated like Matt said too, um, 
to try and prioritize this. And also because we're requiring them to pick a certain type of resource. We're not just saying, do your refresh and we'll give you money no matter what you pick. Um, we're asking them to do it in order to lead to student savings. So we haven't had as much of that issue. Thanks. Um, and thanks, Matt. I see you posted your language used in monthly check-ins. I think that's really helpful. Um, Luann asked about DOIs or other identifiers for OER, and I know a lot of people answered Luann in the chat. Um, I have seen Virginia Tech assign DOIs. Um, I think there's some conversation about ISBNs, which you do need if you're going to provide print copies in particular, and you most likely will have to pay for if you want to be the publisher of record. Um, any other questions? or um, things that any of you would like to keep talking about that you've been talking about in chat as we near the end of our hour together? Let me just toss one thing out about ISBNs because I'm just re-upping my log. I have a, a private press that I've run for years. Um, 10 ISBNs will run you about $500 if you buy them in block. Get them from Bowker. Um, I think Jonathan mentioned that he got one of the, the free ones through an, an upline uh, an on on demand publisher um, that is an identifier and you have to have it for anything that goes through Amazon or most of the other re uh, online resellers um, but an ISBN log if you remember if you're going to do real publishing you know monographic type publishing uh, open or not remember that you have to have not just one ISBN you have to have one for the digital copy one for the hardback copy one for the the softback copy, one for the digital publication copy. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Thanks, Richard. Um, I see other people are posting in their check-in language in the chat, which is really super um, to share with one another. And Amy's referencing her many mail merge projects. Um, someday we should host an office hour session with Amy about mail merge. Um, Amy Larson is asking for budgeting for publicity. Would any of our guests or other people on the call care to discuss um, recommendations or strategies for getting budgeting for OER publicity? I can, I can just say we haven't, by publicity, I, I, I assume what, what comes to mind to me is our faculty and student outreach efforts that we do. And um, to be honest with you, we haven't spent very much money on that. Uh, we have been able to get, uh, so, so what we, again, we, we try to utilize some of the existing resources that we have. So whenever we have something along the lines of a, a workshop or a pro some professional development opportunity or some sort of like an event, or if it's just like a big email needs to be sent out, we can work with um, a central ed editor district. We have Maricopa Center for Learning and Innovation, which is a group of instructional designers and project managers and things like that, that, that are they're there to support all the different projects that people are doing across our district. So again, we try to utilize those existing resources. Uh, when it comes to the cost of printing materials, or um, we one thing we did this year was we purchased a whole bunch of um, like sample copies of OpenStax books and gave them out to all the libraries across our district so that they had them on hold and they could, or so that the OER committees at the individual colleges could actually just have that physical thing to bring along. I don't remember who said it earlier, but it's totally true. I mean, some faculty just don't get OER until you show them the book and you're like, it is real. It's an actual book. Like if, if you want that, this is what you can have, you know? And, and so we wanted to provide them with those physical things. It, you know, we bought like 50 OpenStax books and then, you know, that cost like $2,000 something like that. And all of the printing, the stickers that we printed out, we have this whole campaign that we, we were about to launch uh, physically before all, everything happened, which was an ask for OER. We wanted to try to get students engaged uh, in this whole discussion a little bit more. Um, and so we had, a, we had one of our, um, we had a graphic designer who works in one of the centers for teaching and learning at our colleges. Again, he does work for us. He does graphic design work for us as part of his job at the college. And so we don't have to pay him extra money. He is obviously spending his time doing those projects instead of other things that he might be doing for the college. But that's just reallocation that is okay for, with them. Um, and so we bought about, I, I think it was like $1,200 worth of stickers. I don't know. 
4,000, 5,000 stickers that we were just going to pass out to students. And those are now sitting at the district office. I don't know if they'll ever get physically passed out, but nonetheless, uh, we are, uh, that's about all it was is, is for this year, just, you know, a few printing costs and stuff. We don't do any other kind of like, um, you know, publication or publicity issues. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And I'd like to um, point out Regina's comment in the chat who says that they partner with university-wide PR, library communications, and others who will help with press releases and other outreach to student papers and social media. And then I also included a link to Publicizing OER. It's a LibGuide um, from Illinois that I think is really helpful in sort of pointing out all the different um, places that you can promote the OER that your faculty are creating. So this has been a very lively session. Thank you for your conversation in the chat and in the call. I would like to thank our guests as well, and please join me in thanking Richard, Tanya, and Matthew for sharing their stories and getting our conversation started. And we look forward to seeing you again in June. And looking ahead to June, our subject will be sprints, book sprints, um, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, so watch out for details for that coming very soon. Thank you all so much to everybody. A uh, really great conversation today. Thank you and take care. See you soon.